What's up, TLC family? I am super, super excited to be before you today and to share uh, what I believe God has placed on my heart for our church. If you have not had the opportunity for us to meet yet, my name is Alvin Hamilton, and I serve as the youth and outreach pastor here at the Life Church RVA. I don't know about you, but this church has completely changed my life. And if you're like me and that you know that your life will never be the same because it was happening at TLC, do me a favor and let us know in the comments. Say something like, I love my church. Say, I love TLC. Say something like, this is my church. Let us know how much you just appreciate and love the anointing and the calling that is on TLC. I know that when you are an in-house speaker, you don't typically go through the formalities that a guest speaker would go through, but I don't believe I would be given honor where honor is due if I don't do that. And so can you do me a favor and just help me celebrate our lead pastors, Pastor Vernon and Pastor Ashley Gordon. I don't know about you, but I love them so much. So Pastor Vernon and Pastor Ashley, if you're watching this, I need you to know that I love you. I love your family. And I'm so grateful that you said yes to the call of God on your life. And it's because you said yes that me and so many others around the world are now able to say yes to the call that is on our life. Pastor Vernon and Pastor Ashley, Madison and Jackson, we love you so much. I also want to give a quick honorable mention to two people who I love so much, Pastor Rivers and Pastor Lauren. I thank you so much for just being my big brother, my big sister. I know there were so many days where you were pushing me and so many days that you wanted me to become all that God wanted me to be. And I know sometimes I felt like you were picking on me and I know sometimes I felt like you were bullying me, but I just got to let you know from the stage that I get it now. And I'm so grateful that you never allowed me to settle for less than who God called me to be. I love you so much. I'm going to jump right in. I don't want to take up too much time, uh, but I'm going to be reading from Haggai chapter 1, verses 2 through 6. Then I'm going to jump to verses 9 through 11. And I'm also going to read chapter 2, verses 3 through 9. We do have a lot of scripture today, but I do believe that God has something he wants to say to us. And I don't want to be the one who cuts him short. And before I jump in, the title of my message today is going to be God's plan. So if you have paper and you have a pencil or a pen, write out God's plan. Before I jump in, I kind of want to give you some context of what's happening. We're in this book, and the Hebrews have been sent to captivity for hundreds and hundreds of years because of their disobedience to God. And after turning from their idols and after repenting, God allows the Persians to come in and say, you know what, I'm going to set you free because you made a better decision. You decided to turn from your evil ways. You decided to turn from your wicked ways and worship me. And so God sends the Persians and he sets the Hebrews free. And the Hebrews are on the way back to Jerusalem, but God stops them and said, when you get home, I want you to do one thing. You don't have any other responsibility but to do one thing. And I want you to rebuild my temple that was destroyed in battle. And the Hebrews are like, okay, God, I got it. I know what you're calling me to do. I'll rebuild the temple. That's what you want me to do. But as soon as they get back, that's not what the Hebrews do. The Hebrews begin to concern themselves with their personal preferences. They begin to concern themselves with what, with what they want to do in life. So they begin to build houses and have children. They begin to raise livestock. They begin to, to build everything that they wanted and not what God called them to do. And in the midst of this, God raises up a prophet named Haggai. And the prophet comes in and is like, guys, God just gave us grace. God just gave us mercy. God just gave us the opportunity to do it better this time, yet you concern yourselves with what you want to do. And this is where our text begins. Chapter 1, verse 2, it reads, This is what the Lord says. The people are saying, the time has not yet come to build the house of the Lord. Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? And this is what the Lord says. Look at what's happening to you. You have planted much, but you harvest little. You eat, but are not satisfied. You drink, but are still thirsty. You put on clothes, yet cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. If you jump to verse 9, it reads, You hoped for rich harvest, yet you were poor. And when you bought your harvest home, I blew it all away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins while you are busy building your own fine houses. And now it's because of you that the heavens withhold the dew and the earth produces no crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olive trees and, and to destroy all your other crops, a drought to starve you and your livestock and to destroy everything you have worked so hard to get. Can we jump to chapter two? Chapter two, verse three says, does anyone remember this house? This temple in its former splendor, how in comparison does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all, but now, says the Lord, 
but now, says the Lord. I love it when scripture throws a but now in there. If you look at the definition of but now, it's used to introduce a phrase or a clause that contrasts what has already been said. So whenever you see but now, that means anything that comes before but now is canceled. It's casted away. You don't have to worry about it because what's about to happen next is relevant. What's about to happen next is important. So you can say stuff like, I was sick, but now God healed my body. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was broke, but now I'm rich. But now means whatever I said before, don't worry about it because I'm about to do a new thing. Be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land. And now get to work, for I am with you, says the Lord. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised you when I came out of Egypt. So do not be afraid, for this is what the Lord says. In just a little while, I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry lands. I will shake every nation, and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple. For I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord. The silver is mine. And the gold is mine, says the Lord. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord. And in this place, I will bring peace. Family, let us pray. God, we thank you so much for your word that is true. We thank you that it's relevant. We thank you that although it was written over 2,000 years ago, God, it still meets us right where we are today. And so right now, God, I surrender everything that I am and all that I have to you, God. All I want to do is be a vessel for you to communicate to your people, God. So I pray, God, that you would just touch me, God. Take away fears. Take away nervousness, God. Take away anxieties, God. And let every word that I say be breathed on through the Holy Spirit, oh God. And I pray that it would touch every listener, God. I pray it would touch every person right where they are and whatever they're going through. God, this is your moment. God, speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I don't know if any of you are like me and... Quarantine has given you so much time just to think about your life and think about some of the things you've been through. And as I begin to just look back over the last couple of years, I keep thinking about this story when I was in high school. It was spring break my senior year and me and a couple of my friends, we were coming back uh, from, from uh, Indoor Nationals. We decided we were going to go to the beach. The problem isn't that we were going to go to the beach. The problem is the fact of how we were going to get there we decided we were gonna put six people in a five-seating car. And so what I mean by that is we had my friend in the driver's seat driving, we had me in the passenger seat, and then we had four people in the back of the car when everyone knows it's only three seat belts. If it's three seat belts, that means it's not supposed to be four people. So we're driving, and to just make it a little bit worse, my friend decided he was gonna drive 70 miles down the highway on a 55 mile per hour highway, right? The thing that you don't want to happen most when you're making reckless decisions like that, it happened. We turned around and we see these big, bright blue flashing lights in the rearview mirror. And so my friend, he stops the car, he pulls over. And I can, if I can be honest, now I'm scared because I had just got a scholarship. I never really got in trouble growing up. And family, if I can be honest, I went to Western Branch, but all my friends were from Portsmouth. So if you know anything about people from Portsmouth, you know, they can be a little rough around the edges. So I said, you know what? I'll do the talking. Y'all don't say anything. Let me handle it. The police officer comes and he takes my friend's license and he, he brings it back to his car and he does whatever police do when they run your license. And at this moment, I'm just praying and I'm like, God, if you would just get us out of it this time. I don't know if you're like me and you ever had to have a this time prayer. God, if you would do it this time, I promise to never do it again. And so the officer comes back and he gives my friend his license back and he says, you know what? I, I'm not going to give you a ticket this time because I believe that you're young, but I also know that you can mature from this and you're responsible. And so we're like, okay, cool, thank you. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. This is when I knew that my prayers were affected and I should probably go into ministry because I knew that my prayers worked. So we pulled off, but my friend decides that he's gonna pull off at 70 miles per hour, the same speed limit that almost got us sent to life in prison in the first place. And I'm like, dude, are you crazy? We just got the opportunity to do better, yet you go back and do the same thing that you did before. Why? And as I think about my text and I think about this story, I feel like the Hebrews are much like me and my friends in this story. God has given the Hebrews an opportunity to get out of punishment. And many of us can relate and say that we've escaped some things in life. Some of us have escaped death. Some of us have escaped sickness. Some of us are survivors. Some of us have been through some things and got out of it knowing that we should have still been in on this day. And yet we are still making the same decisions that put us in that situation in the first place. 
How many of us can relate to me and say that I've sometimes used God's grace and mercy as an excuse to keep doing what I wanted to do instead of what he told me to do? And even as Christians, we try to fool ourselves and make ourselves believe that, God, I didn't know what you, were, what you were telling me to do. In all actuality, we knew exactly what it is God was telling us to do. Yet it didn't meet the way we wanted it to meet. It didn't meet our budget for the money. It didn't meet our life plan. It didn't, we didn't meet the family goals we had. So we said, God, I'll do it. I'll do it my way. The Hebrews knew exactly what it was God was telling them to do. Except they said, God, I don't have time for that. I know what you're telling me to do, but God, I've got something more important to focus on. And this brings me to my first point. I want you to write this down. God is more concerned with his plans than he is with your personal preferences. I'll say it again. God is more concerned with his plan than he is with your personal preferences. And I know that that is going to be a hard pill for some of us to swallow because we are so used to our Christianity looking like consumerism. We are so used to saying, God, what can you do for me? Or we are so used to saying, God, this is a vacation. I want my spirituality to be a vacation. I want it to be fun. I want it to be cute. When in all actuality, God is saying, no, I want your spirituality to be a vocation. I want it to be something that you do every single day. I want it to be something that you produce. Many of us get on Instagram, we're happy because we're called. We're happy because we have purpose. We're happy because we're anointed. But Jesus was anointed. And Jesus had purpose. And Jesus was called, yet he died on the cross, a sinner's death. And he did not do that so that you can continue to do what you want to do. He did it so that you can have a second chance at doing the will of his Father on your life. But see, that's the problem we face in 2020. So many of us think that our calling is about us. We think that our calling is supposed to be the thing that makes us rich. God, how can I get rich? God, how can I become famous? God, how can I reach a certain status? When in all actuality, our calling has nothing to do with us and everything to do with God. God, how can I make your name great? God, how can I bring more money to your kingdom? God, how can I make more people know your name? It's not about us. It's not about us. And this story reminds me so much of me and my dad's relationship. I remember when I was growing up, there was a series or a season in my life where I wanted to be rebellious. And from that point, I began to make decisions that were not a good reflection of how my father raised me. And one day my dad pulled me to the side and he said, son, I recognize what you're trying to do and I recognize the life you're trying to live, but unfortunately I'm not going to allow you to do that because that is not a good reflection of who I am and that is not a good reflection of my house. He said, I love you too much to allow you to destroy your life with your own personal temporary preferences of what you think is best for you. And I need somebody to know that God loves you enough to not allow you to make decisions that go against what he said about you. God loves you enough to not allow you to go down a path that he did not call for you to do. And that's hard for us because we don't like to hear that. We think that we're supposed to order our own steps and say, God, you bless it. But no, we're supposed to say, God, what is the path you have for me? God, where do you want me to work? God, what do you want me to do? God, who are you calling me to be? We need to focus on what God is saying to us, not what we're saying to God. Do we really think that we know more about our future than God knows about us? We don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, yet we think we can make a life plan and not ask God what to do. God cares enough about you to not allow you to concern yourselves with what you want to do. He cares enough about you to make sure that you are in alignment with what he knows is best for you. The Bible says, why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? I like to think of it this way. Why are you doing what you want to do when I've already given you a mission? I've already given you a vision. I already told you what I want you to do, yet you come back after I've given you a second chance. You continue to do what you want to do. That's not how it works. And I know that this is difficult. And I know this is hard. And I know that this is not something that most preachers preach about. But family, I've got to let you know that God has a purpose in your life. God has a vision for your life. And the reason why some of us don't ever see fruit produced in our lives is because we are trying to build our lives on something that God has not ordained. We are trying to build our lives without God. And there's nothing you can do on this earth. There's nothing that you can build. There's nothing that you can work for that will produce fruit or that will last if God is not in the midst. It is temporary and it will fall away. And maybe you're somebody who's saying, you know what, I get it. That's cool. I know that already. I know what God has for me. I know what God wants me to do. But God, if I'm being honest, the thing you have for me, God, is not convenient for me. 
God, the thing you have for me doesn't meet my goals. God, the thing you have for me doesn't meet my expectations. God, I didn't grow up in a family that looks like that. Why would you be calling me to do that? God, I grew up as a track runner. Why would you call me to go in ministry? We have these questions and we ask God these questions. God, why? I don't want to do that. But let me point your attention to something I believe is so important. The Bible says in verse 10, it's because of you that the heavens withhold the dew and the earth produces no crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olive trees and all of your other crops, a drought to starve you and your livestock and to ruin everything you have worked so hard to get. Family, what happens when we decide to choose our plans over God's plans? Family, what happens when we say, God, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do what I want to do. The text tells us the Hebrews, they planted crops, they raised livestock, they built their houses. Yet when it came time for harvest, they looked to the side and they looked to the other side and they looked at what was in their hand and they had nothing. They had nothing but a drought. What do you do when you feel like, God, I gave it all I've got. God, I shot my best shot. God, I did everything I could. Yet when it came time for me to reap what I sowed, all I've got is a drought. If you look at the definition of a drought, it's a prolonged or chronic shortage or lack of something expected or desired. How many of us can relate to being in a season when we gave our all, we bled, we sweat, we cried, we prayed, we fasted. Yet when it came time for us to get what we wanted, we had nothing but a drought. We had nothing to say that we worked so hard. God, I went to work 80 hours a week, yet I'm still living the way I'm living. God, what do I have to show for all that I've done? And God is saying, but I didn't tell you to do that. God is saying, you work so hard for nothing. Because when you try to produce fruit, I brought famine on the land because you were not in alignment with what I said about you. And I've got to let you know, I'm not trying to preach something that I haven't lived, but there is nothing that you can do on this earth without God that will produce fruit. That's not how our spirituality, is not how our Christianity works. This story again reminds me so much of my dad. And dad, if you're watching this, I'm sure you are. I just want to let you know that I love you. And I'm so grateful for the way you raised me. The way you raised me showed me how God could love me. When I was younger and I used to do things that were disobedient, my dad would discipline me. Now, I can't tell you how he would discipline me. What I can tell you is I never got popped before. And as I got older, my discipline turned from one thing to restrictions. And so when I was disrespectful or when I was making bad grades, my dad would restrict some things from me. He would take some things away from me. He'll take away my phone. He'll take away my laptop. He'll take away my privileges. And he didn't do it because he hated me. He didn't do it because he wanted it to hurt me. He did it because he needed me to focus on what the priority was. He was willing to remove anything that was a distraction from what the priority in my life was. And I want you to know that your heavenly father, your God in heaven cares more about you than to let you be distracted by things that are temporary. Your heavenly father cares more about you than to let you do what you want to do. So yes, he'll hold some things back from you. He'll take away a relationship. He'll take away a raise. He'll take away a paycheck if that's what it takes for you to put your mind and set your eyes on him. He's not going to allow you to be distracted to the point point where you can't do what he's calling you to do. And yes, a drought hurts and it feels like suffering and it feels like pain. But if God has to hurt you to help you, then that's what he'll do because that's how much he loves you. He loves you enough to take away anything. God even closed the doors of the church until his people learn how to get into a relationship with him. God will take away anything that is distracting you from him. He loves you too much for you to concern yourself with what you want to do. And if he has to take it away from you, he will. He held back the rain. He brought famine. He allowed them to see a drought and nothing. What do you do when you feel like, God, I thought I did everything right. God, I thought I did what I wanted to do. God, people said, follow your dream. So God, I followed my dream. Yet I've got nothing. Your dream, your plans, your personal preferences is not as important to God as what he's calling you to do and as to what he said about you and to the purpose and anointing that he put on your life. 
We've got to stop saying me, me, me. We live in a me culture. God, it's all about me. God, how can I do what I want to do? But we're supposed to live in a God culture. God, how can I do what you're calling me to do? Even if, and even if it's inconvenient. Even if it's uncomfortable. I want to read chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. It says, does anyone remember this house, this temple in its former splendor? How in comparison does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. Family, this part broke me. This part showed me the humanity that is in the Bible. This part showed me how I can place myself in the Bible. You see, the Hebrews were in a situation when they had built this big, beautiful temple yet it got destroyed. And now God, you're telling me to build this temple again? You're telling me to build this temple again? The Hebrews, they saw what the temple looked like before. It was big, it was beautiful, it was grand. But then they looked at what it looked like now and God, all I see is destruction. God, all I see is defeat. When I look at this, I see destruction, defeat, I see brokenness. And God, you're telling me to build the temple again, it doesn't make sense. The last time I built it, it got destroyed. Why would I do it again? God, I want to do what you're telling me to do, but God, the last time I did it, I looked like a fool. God, I want to step out on faith, but the last time I did it, you didn't come through for me. God, the last time I tried to save my money, I went through a drought and I had to exhaust my savings account. God, I want to do what you're telling me to do, but God, if I'm being honest, I'm scared. God, I'm scared that you may not show up for me the way you said you would show up for me. God, I'm scared that you may not do what you said you would do. God, I know that you're faithful and I know that your word is true. But God, if I look at my circumstances, it doesn't look like that. Because what I've got is destroyed. I want to jump to verse 4. It says, how in comparison does it look to you now must seem like nothing at all. Family. We have to stop holding God hostage to how we think he can show up on our behalf. We have to stop limiting God to what we think he can and cannot do for us. Family, if God has given us a word, if God has given us a vision, if God has given us a mission, we have to pursue it even though we don't know what it's going to look like yet. (laughs) This part, it blessed me so much because I thought to myself, God... If you held back the rain, and God, if you held back the dew, and if God, if you took everything away because of my disobedience, God, I can't imagine what you do if I drop to my knees and say, God, I don't know how you're going to do it, and God, I don't know when you're going to show up, and God, I don't know how you're going to make a way for me, but God, I trust you because God, I know that you're faithful. God, I know that defeat is not in your resume. God, I know you can do all things but fail, so God, I'm submitting to you. God, I'm dropping on my knees, and whatever you want me to do, God, I'll do it, even though I don't know if you're going to show up yet. God, I'll go to school even though I don't know if I'm going to pass. God, I'll launch a business even though I don't know if it's going to be successful. God, I'll go to church even though I don't know if I'm going to be saved or not. But God, I know that you told me to do it, so God, that's what I'll do. Because I'm willing to trust you more than I trust myself. Family, when will we get to a point where we say, God, it doesn't matter what I think. Only thing that matters is what you said. The only thing that matters is what you told me. So God, no, this temple doesn't look like your glory can still come through, but God, I guarantee you that if I build it, then maybe you'll do something about it. If you jump to verse 6, it says, For this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. In just a little while, I will again shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry lands. I will shake every nation, and the treasures of every nation will be brought to this temple. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord. And in this place, I will bring peace. I don't know who needs to know this. But God is still in the business of bringing glory to things that he told you to build. God is still in the business of blessing everything that he has his hand on. There is nothing that God touches that glory does not come through. There is nothing that you can build in the name of God and not expect fruit to be produced and not expect success and not expect glory. We can't say, God, it's not going to work out for me. No, if I told you to do it, that means he has no choice but to work. 
because I am not a man that he should lie nor a man that he should repent in the same way I've been doing it for thousands and thousands of years. I can still do it today. I never lost glory. Yes, this temple is destroyed, but I destroyed it so that my glory can still come through. And my glory is going to come through greater than the past glory. My glory is going to be greater than it ever has before. Once you learn to stop trusting yourself and once you learn to build what I told you to build, all you got to do is build it. All you've got to do is build it. Build it anyway. Build it even when it looks broken. Build it even when it looks beyond repair. Fix your heart even when you're saying, God, I want, I want to fix my heart, but I'm scared that it's going to be broken again. No, fix it anyway. Because I guarantee you that if I tell you to do something, it's not going to fail. My word will not come back to me void. I'm not a liar. I've never failed. I've never lost a battle. And the reason why you think you are in a drought and the reason why you think nothing is being produced in your life is because you refuse to build the temple that I've called you to build. You refuse to do what I've called you to do. You keep building your own life. You keep building your own habits when I've already given you a vision. If you would dare get to work and start building what God is calling you to build, if you would dare get to work and start doing what God is calling you to do, I guarantee you that you will see glory be produced in your life. But it starts with trusting him. And stop concerning yourselves with your own personal preferences. Family, it's not over yet. Many of us think that it's over because we see a drought. No, 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 no. The drought comes to refocus you. The drought comes to put you back in position with God. The drought is only here because there's a temple somewhere for you to build. And God had to take something away from you to keep it from distracting you from his plan for you. It's not over for you yet. If you still have breath in your body, that means there's a temple from somewhere for you to build. And that means that there's still glory attached to what God is calling you to do. It's not over yet. Start building. Start getting to work. Start setting your mind right. Start getting your budget right. Start doing whatever it is God is asking you to do. And in just a little while my glory will come through better than it's ever came through before. So Finley, I want to take the next couple of moments to pray. I want to pray for the person who is saying, God, I know what you're calling me to do. God, I know the vision and the mission you have for my life. But God, if I'm being honest, I'm scared. This is God. When I look at it, I see impossibility. When I look at it, God, I see that it's not going to work out for me. Family, I probably shouldn't do this, but I feel so heavy on my heart to be transparent with you. Two years ago, I made a decision to stop building my luxurious house and focus on the plan God has for me. I went to VCU on a scholarship. I've been running my entire life, yet I felt the call of God on my life to go into ministry. And there was days when I said, God, I'm not going to do this because, God, it looks impossible. And God, if I step out on faith, what if you don't meet me halfway? God, if I get out the boat, what if I drown? But now, says the Lord. But now, says the Lord, family, I'm here. I didn't fail. And it's not because I'm so great. It's not because I have the experience. It's not because I'm so good. But it's because God's word is true and will not fail. God can still bring glory even when it does not meet our expectations, even when it does not look the way we think it's going to look, God can still bring glory. And I also want to pray for the person who feels like I've been in this drought. I've been in this drought too long. I keep pushing and every time I step this way, I got to step two steps this way. God, I'm in this drought. What am I supposed to do? It's over for me. Family, it's not over for you. You are only in a drought. Because there is still glory attached to the temple God has asked you to build. And once you make up in your mind that, God, I'm going to do what you're calling me to do. And, God, I'm going to walk this way even though it's dark. And, God, I'm going to step out on faith even though I might drown. But, God, I trust you. I guarantee you once you make that decision, you will have rivers of glory available to you. Family, the drought does not last always. The drought is temporary to put you back in alignment with God's priority for your life. So let us pray.